humans in North America for 130,000 years. We're going to go to an original article that was published in Nature in 2017. 130,000 year old archaeological site in Southern California, USA. Usually it's more fun to start with the, uh, the popular, but this time I'm going to bring you t uh, to the original and then we'll, uh, we'll look at how it's been treated. And uh, the abstract of the original starts out the earliest dispersal of humans into North America is a contentious subject. And uh, they are not understating that. And proposed early sites are required to meet the following criteria for acceptance. One, archaeological evidence is found in a clearly defined and undisturbed geologic context. Nobody's buried this stuff. Two, age is determined by reliable radiometric dating. Keep that in mind. Three, multiple lines of evidence from interdisciplinary studies provide consistent results. Keep that in mind too. And four, unquestionable artifacts are found in primary context. Sorry, this is nature, that's British. Live with it. Okay. <clears throat> Here we describe the Saruti Mastajan site, an archaeological site from the early Pleistocene epoch where in situ Hammer stones and stone anvils occur in spatiotemporal association with fragmentary remains from a single mastodon, Mammut americanum. It's, uh, notice the same genus as mammoths. Um, the CM site contains spiral fractured bone and molar fragments, indicating that breakage occurred while fresh. Several of these fragments also preserve evidence of percussion being struck. Oh, before we go on, the Mastodon site is located right along that highway, 54. Um, in San Diego. Well, actually, technically, between National City and uh, Chula Vista. The, occurrences, the occurrence and distribution of bone, molar, and stone refits what are refits? Those are, bone, those are stones or bones that you can take and put back together and they fit. Suggest that breakage occurred at the site of burial. Five large cobblestone hammerstones and anvils in the CM bone bed display use wear and impact marks and are hydraulically anomalous relative to low energy context of the enclosing sandy silt stream. You have a bunch of sand and suddenly you have this boulder. Well, cobble if you want to call it that. Um, it shouldn't have been transported with the rest of that stuff. Um, you, uh, 230 thorium uranium radiometric analysis of multiple bone specimens using diffusion absorption decay dating models, whatever that is indicates a burial date of 130.7 plus or minus 9.4 thousand years ago. These findings confirm the presence of an unidentified species of Homo. Is it Neanderthal? Is it Denisovan? Is it Homo sapiens? Is it Homo erectus? Whatever indicating that humans with manual dexterity and the experiential knowledge to use hammerstones and anvils processed mastodon limb bones for marrow extraction and or raw material for tool production. Systematic proboscidean bone reduction, uh, um, that proboscidean is just a fancy way of saying mammoth mastodon elephant, Evident at the CM site fits within a broader pattern of Paleolithic bone percussion technology in Africa, Eurasia, and North America. Note the references in the abstract. The CM site is, to our knowledge, the oldest in situ, well documented archaeological site in North America, and as such, substantially revises the timing of the arrival of Homo into the Americas. 
So that's their bottom line. Suddenly we have some kind of human in North America 130,000 years ago. That, of course, is anomalous compared with most, much of what else we've seen. The CM site was excavated by paleontologists. Oh, we're into the article now. The CM site was excavated by paleontologists from the San Diego Natural History Museum in 1992 to 1993. It's a long time coming. And we're going to find out why in a bit. In coastal San Diego County, uh, California, USA. Mastodons and cobbles were found in a 20 to 30 centimeters thick. 30 centimeters is about a foot. Um, sandy, silty bed that was obtained within a 12 uh, meter thick sequence of Pleistocene sediments. The stratigraphic section consists of multiple upward finding sequences of silt and fine grained sand deposited in a low energy fluvial environment. Flooded, flooded, but not very rapidly. Other strata in the same fluvial sequence contain fossils of extinct land mammals. For example, dire wolf, horse, camel, mammoth, and ground sloth. So there are other mammoths around. The disarticulated partial skeleton of a young adult male mastodon recovered over a 50 meter squared area from bed E consists of two tusks, three molars, four vertebrae, 16 ribs, two phalanges, two sesamoids. Those are um, kind of like the kneecap, only they occur in, uh, in humans in the thumb. And apparently there's some in elephants in the same general kind of thing. Um, and over 300 bone fragments. One tusk was found lying horizontally, which is what you'd expect, and the other was oriented vertically with the distal portion penetrating the underlying strata. It was stuck into the ground like that. Um, femora were a, represented by detached femoral heads and spiral fractured diaphyseal fragments that had been broken while fresh, whereas several fragile ribs and vertebrae were unbroken, which doesn't fit your carnivory model. Two concentrations of spiral fractured bone and broken molar fragments were delineated, each clustered around a separate andesite cobble, concentrations one and two. Refitting bone fragments were found in concentration one, where both femoral heads lay adjacent to each other. Three refitting fragments of a percussion fractured upper molar included one large segment in each concentration and a cusp fragment that was found halfway between. Pegmatite fragments, kind of rock, were found in concentration one refit with a large pegmatite cobble. Refitting andesite fragments and an andesite cobble, andesite is a uh, light colored volcanic uh, rock, lava that's hardened, uh, and an andesite cobble that refits with an andesite flake were found in concentration two. The idea is you hit, the ro uh, hit something with a rock, a piece of it breaks off, and they just left it there. If these had been swept somewhere, you wouldn't expect that flake and the rock to wind up going the same, in the same place. <clears throat> Extensive evidence of percussion on bone and molars is present. And I'm going to skip their evidence. I'm going to just say that I accept it. Use wear and impact marks on five CM cobbles were compared with similar features pr produced on hammerstones and anvils that were used in bone breakage experiments. So they went out and tried this. And sure enough, when they tried breaking bones, they got the same kinds of fractures and fragments and so forth, including uh, uh, and, uh, hammerstone fragments. Um, and with those described in published studies. So they did their own experiments. They, did, they looked at other people's experiments, and it all matches. Multiple mo bone and molar fragments, which show evidence of percussion, together with the presence of an impact notch 
and attached and detached cone flakes. Cone flakes are you hit something and it breaks on the inside from where it, you've seen bullet holes in glass where there's a hole and then there's a, a whole cone of glass has come out the other side. That's what we're talking about, cone fragments. Detached cone flakes support the hypothesis that human-induced hammerstone percussion was responsible for the observed breakage. Alternative hypotheses, carnivorian modification, saber-toothed tiger, whatever, um, trampling, weathering, and fluvial processes do not adequately explain the observed evidence. No Pleistocene carnivorin was capable of breaking fresh proboscidean femora uh, at mid-shaft or producing the wide impact notch. And uh, this is, by the way, detection of intelligent design. The presence of attached and detached cone flakes is indicative of hammerstone percussion, not carnivorin gnawing. There is no other type of carnivorin bone modification at the CM site, nor is there bone modification from trampling. The differential pres preservation of fragile ribs, in other words, you're a carnivore, you'd rather go for the easier bones to break, right? And vertebrae, rather than heavy limb bones, argues against trampling and is consistent with selective breakage by humans. Although some thick cortical limb bone fragments display longitudinal cracks and breaks, these features uh, occurred after the after percussive bone modification. So they're capable of telling whether it was done by humans initially or afterwards. And were caused by pre-burial fa factors, for example, subburial weathering, or by post-depositional factors, for example, wetting, drying cycles within the soil zone. Well, that just says it is caused by something other than humans. The occurrence of large and small bones together with five large cobbles within an otherwise sandy silt, horizon, indicates that fluvial processes did not transport these bones and stones. They're too heavy for the kind of currents we're talking about. Spiral fractured femoral fragments of both femoral heads adjacent to cobble CM281 indicate that both femora were broken in that location. The vertical tusk is interpreted as the result of purposeful placement. Somebody stuck it in the ground, maybe to mark the spot. <coughs> Fracture patterns and impact damage found on CM limb bones are consistent with the results of experimental replication of Paleolithic proboscidean bone percussion technology using hammerstones and anvils to fracture elephant and cow femora. <coughs> I guess cows were the heaviest other animal they could find. Breakage patterns like those recorded at the CM and other archaeological sites were produced experimentally, as was anvil polish. During three experiments, hammerstones accidentally struck a stone anvil and produced breakage features like those on hammerstones CM383 and CM423. <coughs> The taphonomic patterns of the CM bone bed also differs from that of skeletons of horse and dire wolf discovered in adjacent strata within the same Pleistocene fluvial stratigraphic sequence. <coughs> mm. These skeletons are more complete, <coughs> do not show evidence of spiral fractures or percussion impacts, and do not occur in association with cobbles. <coughs> now, here's part of the answer that you're asking. Initial attempts to date the CM site using radiocarbon analysis at two independent laboratories failed <coughs> because the samples lacked sufficient collagen. You couldn't get in a good enough sample. <coughs> Several attempts to date the site with optically stimulated luminescence indicated that samples were near or beyond the upper limits of dose saturation, <coughs> meaning there's been a lot of radiation in the area. 
<coughs> and that <coughs> the depositional age of the sediment is greater than 60 to 70,000 years. Subsequently, multiple bone fragments were analyzed by uranium series disequilibrium experiments. Profiles consisting of 13, 20, and 30 subsamples of cortical material <coughs> across <coughs> 12 to thir uh, 23 millimeter thick sections of two spirally fractured limb bones and one rib yield a consistent U-shaped patterns for both uranium concentration and conventionally calculated 234 to uranium ages. These patterns, <coughs> <coughs> these patterns are consistent with scenarios of post-burial uranium uptake by diffusion and absorption. Think about that. The uranium uptake is after the animal died. <coughs> Which means by definition, at that point we have an open system. Right? <coughs> And yield apparent closed system, apparent closed system, 234, uh, 230 thorium to uranium ages, age, ranging from 100 to 107 kilo years uh, for interior subsamples and 112 <laughs> to 125 kilo years for subsamples from exterior cortical layers. But they don't believe that. <coughs> because their final age is 130,000 years, right? Initial 234 uranium to 238 uranium activity ratios calculated for bone subsamples spans a narrow range that is consistent with modern shallow groundwater from the nearby Sweetwater River drainage, providing increased confidence in the 230 thorium to uranium ages. So what they do is they take that other data and they put it into a model. That 130,000 years is not actually what they measured, it's what their model says. <coughs> Results calculated using diffusion absorption decay modeling, that's their model, for profiles of multiple specimens indicate a burial age estimate of 130.7 plus or minus 9.4 kiloyears. Weighted mean of three maximum likelihood ages de determined for bone, bone profiles. What you're seeing is huge massaging of data. Thank you very much. <coughs> and when you read that, that, that age, it sounds pretty good until you realize all of the manipulation that went into it, right? Okay? Uh, <coughs> isotope data are consistent with diffusion of uranium into interior portions of cortical bone and show no obvious evidence for post-burial uranium leaching that would yield erroneously old ages. No obvious evidence of post-burial uranium leaching, which, if it happened, would yield erroneous ages. We conclude that the reliably dated, there's your reliable date, Surudi Mastodon site constitutes an in situ archaeological association based on a clearly defined and undisturbed stratigraphic context, comparative taphonomy, Bone modifications like those produced by Paleolithic percussion technology and replicated by experimental archaeology. Presence of hammer stones and anvils that exhibit use wear and impact march, marks and presence of rock fragments that can be refitted to breakage scars on the original rock. <coughs> bone breakage for marrow extraction in, or bone or molar tool manufactured is the preferred archaeological interpretation of the CM site as there is no evidence of butchery. So uh, they were just trying to get the marrow out of the bones. <coughs> or maybe to uh, make tools out of them. Yeah. 
and in tough bonds. Concordant interdisciplinary lines of evidence for this, from this study suggest the presence of Homo in North America during the last interglacial and as early as approximately 130,000 years ago. This discovery calls for further archaeological investigation focused on North American strata of early Pleistocene age. <coughs> That's the article. Well, actually, there's a little bit more. Now you get into some methods. And um, I'll just quote a few paragraphs here. Discovery and excavation of the Cerruti Mastodon site, the CM site, was discovered during routine paleo paleontological monitoring of grading operations for construction of a sound berm along the north side of State Route 54 in San Diego, San Diego County, California, USA. Paleontological monitors from the San Diego Natural History Museum. So they were kind of just looking to see, uh, you know, are we digging up anything interesting that we need to stop and, and actually dig? <coughs> and they found this stuff. Observed mastodon bone and tooth fragments being unearthed in a distinctly sandy silt stratum, Betty, by a caterpillar backhoe. Interesting, they give the exact kind of backhoe. This <coughs> stratum extended to the south berm beneath, uh, pardon me, to, to the south beneath the south berm. This is the north side of the freeway and it goes quite a ways. And again, there's the site right along Highway 54. Skipping on down a little bit, <coughs> uranium series dating, samples, uranium series isotope analyses were determined by thermal ionization mass spectrometry at the USGS Denver Radiogenic Isotope Laboratory on specimens collected and cur curated by the San Diego Natural History Museum. Initial attempts to use specimen of bones from the, in pardon me, initial attempts use specimen of bone from the initial backhoe excavation. <coughs> I guess that means subsequent attempts were used, uh, used a different kind of uh, bone. Uh, subsequent dating efforts focused on cortical bone profiles from specimens of rib or limb bone found in situ. So I guess the first they just tried bones that they otherwise can't use. <coughs> and then they tried ones that were actually part of the dig. Uh, focused on uh, cortical bone profiles from specimens of rib or limb bone found in situ from mapped area of bone concentrations, including specimens with spiral fractures, which means those are the ones that the humans did, presumably. Uh, specimens were sectioned along the along axis of bone and polished. <coughs> the uh, degree of mineralization in cortical bone is high, however, low uranium calcite Filling micropores do not contribute appreciably to the isotopic composition of the high uranium hydroxyapatite bone matrix. I guess uranium likes hydroxyapatite better than calcite. And dark stained material was avoided wherever possible, mostly mang manganese oxides. However, stained and unstained material yielded similar uranium thorium concentrations and isotope compositions. In other words, they tried to avoid it, but it didn't really matter whether you used the, the good stuff or the bad stuff, get, got the same date, which is <coughs> probably reassuring in terms of the, the dates themselves or, the, or the, the data themselves. Okay, <coughs> now I'm going to switch from that now to a popular account um, I'm going to tell you that I've actually toned it down a little bit. <clears throat> this is written sort of in the manner of Indiana Jones. <clears throat> Archaeology is blood support, how an ancient mastodon ignited debate over humans' arrival in North America. This is December 2, 2017. And it's available online in case you want to look it up. And you can see with the stuff I omitted, and I think you'll agree that it, actually the the more um, florid stuff, uh, I've left some of it out. <coughs> the article starts with Richard Ceruti, and he was standing at the foot of a slope being groomed by Caltrans for a road widening project throughout the, uh, through the Sweetwater Valley near National City. <coughs> Earth moving equipment 
catch the tone of this, Earth, Earth Movement Equipment had already under, uncovered other fossils from elsewhere on the site, mostly rodents, birds, and lizards. But this bone was from no ordinary animal. The operator wanted to keep digging, but Saruti raised a fist to stop him. He felt a tightening knot of anger. <coughs> the contractors had worked over the weekend without contacting him, and he could see the damage they had done. Anyway, he managed to stop everything. Um, Saruti hardly suspected on this day, 25 years ago, November 16, 1992, he was standing atop a discovery that would rewrite the opening chapter in the history of the New World. How's that for dramatic writing? Skipping on, when Saruti, a mustachioed collector in a white leisure suit, opened the trunk of his rambler, Demary gasped. Overnight, Saruti's bones, wrapped in linen and old t-shirts, doubled the museum's collection of vertebrate fossils. Skipping on down a little bit, they dug into the slope, primarily following a stratum of silty sandstone no more than a foot thick. Sediment laid down by their estimates nearly 120,000 years ago by a meandering river pushed back by rising seas. I guess they figured this must have been a delta at the time, which is fascinating because that means that 130,000 years ago, the sea level would have had to have been quite a bit higher than it is now. But Leaving that out, <coughs> could these bones, that's in the middle of Ice Age, isn't it? Uh, that's where you normally think that the sea level is low, but whatever. Could these bones be that old? Skipping on, for nearly half a century, school children have been taught that the first human visitors to the New World belonged to the Clovis culture, known for cheap stones, spear points, first discovered in New Mexico. Uh, archaeolo archaeologists say these people crossed the Bering Land Bridge from Asia about 12,000 years ago. To dispute Clovis first by a few thousand years was controversial. Some archaeologists had won begrudging acceptance with a few scattered excavations. But, you know, 13,000, maybe 14,000. Okay. <coughs> But to propose a site more than 100,000 years older was professional suicide. Wait a minute. Why? It would undermine the research and reputations of most archaeologists now studying the New World. Uh, this is science and subjective and just the facts, ma'am. If you claim something is that old, you get blasted, Saruti said, which is why some archaeologists stopped working on sites like this. They didn't want to get blasted. Hmm. Okay. Moving on. Um, I've, uh, Agenbrod, who, um, I'm, I'm pulled Larry from Northern Arizona University, so you have some idea of who they're talking about by Agenbrod, who had made his reputation at the famed Mammoth Graveyard in South Dakota was flummoxed. He could not accept the presence of man on the North American continent so long ago. Anomaly is the key word for this site, as far as I'm concerned, he said, speaking on camera. There are anomalous fragments of rocks, anomalous fragments of tooth enamel scattered throughout the site that, and here he paused between words for effect, just don't make sense in a natural depositional environment. Skipping on down a little bit, Demare sent samples, is that Demare? I'm not sure, um, to a laboratory in Miami for radiocarbon dating, the gold standard for determining the age of archaeological sites. Aha, let's get a, a report came back. There was not enough organic carbon collagen in the sample to allow them to date the critical isotope carbon-14. Now, this next sentence makes no sense, conjugated with the last one, but then this is a newspaper reporter, not a scientist, um, but because organic carbon decomposes over time, the isotopes absent suggested that these specimens were probably older than Clovis culture. You figure that one out. Um, if there's not enough collagen to, to, to date, you can't date it to infinite, right? 
or even older than so much. I mean, your specimen isn't good enough. But moving on, corroboration came from a USC professor, Richard Koo, who had been dating other sites in Southern California using a new, if rudimentary, technique that measured changes in the uranium thorium content of organic materials as they aged. New, if rudimentary. In other words, it's not a very impressive technique, really. What is that technique? After a few months, uh, Ku wrote back the average age of the Tuscan rind was 191,000 years. That technique happens to be uranium thorium dating. But whatever, uh, as exciting as this was, it also seemed too old and felt like a setback. Had the team gotten something wrong? So we go from, you know, from 191 to 100 to 130. Continuing on, in the days, in the years that followed, DeMaria in, uh, invite, invited other researchers to study the collection, but no one stepped forward. <coughs> Robson Bonishin, an anthropologist at Oregon State University and founder of the Center for the Study of Early Man, said, your site may well be a candidate for one of the oldest archaeological sites ever found in the New World. But he added, from my own bitter experience, I know that research that contributes to first American studies is a game of hardball. This is science. It's objective, isn't it? Ooh. George Jefferson, former associate curator of the Page Museum in Los Angeles and district paleontologist for the California State Parks, was blunt. The archaeological community was not ready for such an unsettling claim of antiquity. Keep it under wraps, he said. No one will believe you. The director of the San Diego Museum asked Mary, when are you going to publish? Ooh. You can see that there's some pressure. Saruti felt hopeful when Steve Holland came to San Diego in 2008 with his wife and collaborator Kathleen at DeMary's invitation. As the curator of archaeology at the Denver Museum of Nature, Nature and Science, Holland had heard about the Cerruti Mastodon site, and upon retirement, he and Kathleen decided to look into the claims more carefully. See, this retirement is even better than tenure. He discussed it with DeMary, who realized that he had found his co-author, finally someone with the experience. Together they prepared for battle. Science is objective. DeMary and Holden assembled a team, Ocean's Eleven style. Boy, this is sounding kind of uh, well, not, not quite uh, a professional science, um, disinterested, just the truth. A paleontologist, archaeologist, geoarchaeologist, mastodon specialist, paleo-Indian specialist, sedimentologist, geomorphologist, geochronologist, and lithic fabrication specialist. Now, how many of those, there must be somebody who's doubling because there aren't, 25 names in the paper's uh, 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 authors, but whatever. Um, each scientist took an element of, of the site and applied their proficiency. One concluded that there had been no raging torrents that might have crashed the stones and bones together in a seasonal fury. Another focused on the fragments scattered around the site. The few pieces of bones that they found fit into the smooth spiral fractures and the more plentiful stone fragments matched with the ragged edges of the cobblestones. Okay. Still another redated the site. More than 20 years after Ku's work, remember that's 191,000, the technology for uranium thorium dating had improved and there was a better understanding of the behavior of uranium in bone samples. Jim Paces, a geochronologist at the U.S. Geological Survey in Denver, took dozens of slices from a rib and two femurs. Each slice, no wider than a millimeter, was dissolved in nitric acid. The remaining solutions contained a trace amounts of uranium and thorium, which Paces extracted. After measuring these concentrations in a mass spectrometer, Paces concluded that the bones were 130,700 years old. 
plus or minus 9,400 years. The specificity was stunning. Remember, this is ones where they didn't actually get that date. That's a model date. How could this be wrong, Paces asked himself. Okay. Uh, Steve Holland and DeMary decided to submit their findings to the scientific journal Nature. They thought that the London-based publication would be more open to their interpretation of the site than a journal in the United States. Conclusions such as theirs were more easily accepted in Europe, where sites like this were more common. And I'm going to leave out a bunch of back and forth here. After three rounds of re review by four referees, three archaeologists and one geochronologist, over a course of a year, Nixer accepted the article, formally called a letter. 1,700 word, uh, words, 24 site drawings, eight videos, and 71 pages of supplemental material. The letter was published in April to 2017 and went viral. Its findings landed on the front pages of newspapers and led to many websites. Maybe I should ask, how many of you have heard of this now that they we have one? A descent from some of the world's most distinguished archaeologists was immediate. Brian, uh, Brianna Pobiner damned the work with faint praise. She told Smithsonian Magazine, I think the combination of evidence is on the way to being convincing. Others didn't hold back. Donald Grayson to BuzzFeed News. I was astonished, not because it is so good, but because it is so bad. David Metz, uh, Meltzer to The Guardian. I'm not buying what's being sold. National Geographic pronounced its skepticism in an article entitled Humans in California 130,000 Years Ago. Get the facts. Which, of course, their f version of the facts was... Uh, opposed to this. It was like getting up and shot um, and lined up and shot with machine guns, already said. And there's a whole back and forth about people answering this in journals and, and you can read it uh, if you want more detail. Thomas Kuhn, we're getting through the last, I think, three paragraphs. The scientist philosopher who wrote The Structure of Scientific Revolution said, normal science dominates discourse until anomalies arise that normal science can no longer address. The result is a shift in thinking that ushers in a new era of understanding. DeMary and Holland think that study, which Holland, probably both, I hope, uh, think the study of early man in the new world has reached this point. Richard Cerruti is betting on it. That's the end of the article. So, what's the solution? 130,000 years? pretty good evidence of a human uh, breaking of mastodons? Well, I think the solution lies with a paper by one uh, R. Irvin Taylor, whom some of you may know, uh, at all in 1985, in an article in American Antiquity called Major Revisions in the Pleistocene Age Assignments or North American human skeletons by C14 accelerator mass spectrometry. None older than 11,000 carbon-14 years before present. One of the things that's interesting is that this article, or as far as I can tell, any of its successors was not cited by the people who wrote the Nature article. By the way, it is available online. Now, what's online is just a photograph, and so you can't, uh, you know, copy and paste. So I, I have a fancy little program for doing that anyway, so. Uh, uh, the abstract is very short. Radiocarbon analysis by accelerated mass spectrometry. This is a new technique at the time techniques on organic fractions of human bones from various North American lo localities previously assigned age, ages ranging from about 70,000 to 15,000 years before present now suggest that none of these skeletons is older than 11,000 carbon-14 years before present. And I'll just read a few paragraphs and then show you some data and then we'll uh, move on from there. 
an important part of the data that has been presented to support assertions that human population arrived in North America prior to 11,000 to 11,500 years before present, that is Clovis culture, has been carbon-14, amino acid racemization, and uranium series deduced age estimates obtained directly on Homo sapiens skeletal materials. These age estimates, and particularly the a amino acid racemization determinations, have been employed by some as a part of the data used to argue that Homo sapiens has been in the Western Hemisphere in excess of several tens of thousands, if not several hundreds of thousands, of years. Over the last decade, human skeletons from 13 localities in the New World have been assigned ages greatly in excess of 11,000 years. Interestingly, all but two of these skeletons, Otavo, Ecuador, and Tabor, Alberta, Canada, have been recovered in California. Furthermore, of the 11 California localities, all but one, Sunnyvale, are located in the southern portion of the state, as, by the way, is our mastodon. Skeletons from several Calif seven California sites were assigned to the Pleistocene exclusively on the basis of ages deduced from their aspartic acid uh, DL ratios. Based on conventional decay counting and accelerator mass, mass spectrometric AMS, C14 analysis on various bone organic fractions, the previously Pleistocene ages assigned to human skeletons from several localities have been revised downward into the Holocene. And this article and its successors is the major reason why that you can't have humans before 11,500 radiocarbon years ago is there. Um, these include the Sunnyvale, Haverty, Angeles Mesa, San Jacinto, Riverside, La Jolla Shores, Otalvo, Tabor, Yuha, and Truckhaven skeletons. There's quite a series, and here's, here's their, the first part of their table, and the second part will come up shortly. And I want you to notice something. 70,000 years by amino acid racemization, 36,000 to 480,000 by radiocarbon. Uh, and notice something else, uranium series, that's your friendly old thorium. 8,000 to 9,000, really only 6,000. Amino acid racemization over 50,000 and it reduced down to seven, uh, 4,000 and 7,900. Uh, some of you may have been here when uh, Irv Taylor presented on amino acid racemization and he said it's not much good. This is part of why he says that. 2,000 to 48,000, uh, again, you're looking at 4,000. Uh, amino acid racemization, 41 to 48. A uranium series is a little more conservative, 11,000. Well, it's really only 5,000. Okay, amino acid racemization, 37. Thermoluminescence, in case some of you were listening closely, you heard optically stimulated luminescence. It's the same basic process, just using uh, heat instead of light to, to cause jumps in electrons. Um, and it's um, uh, reduced from 25,000 to 2,300. Amino acid racemization, amino acid racemization, um, this one will be on the top of the next uh, slide still and so you can see that and it's and here's um, carbon-14 even had been misreported uh, if you're careful you, you find out the carbon-14 isn't as uh, isn't as old as uh, as an older technique would have thought and amino acid racemization and here's another uranium series now it's only 5,800 but if you look at it it reduces to less than 4,000. So, you know, significant uh, reductions. Carbon-14, again, coming down. Um, now, my take on all this is fairly simple. I agree that the mastodon found along State Highway 54 in the National City area looks like it had been had its femur split by humans. Yep. 
probably to extract the marrow from the bones, maybe to make, uh, um, but the, bo the marrow to the, from the bones is probably more likely. But in any case, I do have to ask, why should we take a uranium thorium date as definitive when it appears that those dates have been unreliably and specifically too old in the past. And when it appears that the assumption of open system is required to get the date in the first place, and then we have to arbitrarily say it closed off again. I'm skeptical of model ages in this situation. It appears that far too much weight is put on radiometric dating in general, and in this particular case, uranium-thorium date, when dating ancient objects. I suspect that carbon-14 dating is inaccurate itself, probably uh, uh, still making things look older than they really are, but probably not as much as uranium-thorium dating. If one does not have to believe the uranium-thorium dates, then the problem of humans butchering the mammoth disappears. It's just not that old, and it's compatible with all the other ones. The vituperation of the criticism is interesting and leads to the question of whether science is as objective as sometimes claimed. Now, you have to make allowance for the newspaper article. Maybe it's exaggerating how severe that vituperation is. But even so, I think the emotion is kind of striking. Um, and one is reminded of Kuhn's comment that unresolvable arguments tend towards rhetoric. But that's my opinion. Just before it's your turn, these are the femoral heads. Those are the femoral heads with people next to them to give you an idea of the size. And this is a bunch of other stuff they found. But now it is <coughs> your turn. <coughs> Yes, comment there and comment here. When I was growing up, I lived in Bonita, overlooking the uh, Sweetwater Valley. There was a dam up uh, about uh, five miles up the river from where we lived. And uh, in the uh, early 1900s, that dam broke. And there was a huge flood of water coming down the Sweetwater uh, Valley from that uh, dam that t totally disturbed a whole lot of things wa wa wiped, wiped out all of the uh, orchards, all of the farms, all of the ranches that were below the dam, just totally wiped the whole thing, just, just, just made a whole mess of that. And the photographs uh, of that uh, valley after the uh, huge, huge uh, wall of water came down from that, from that dam breaking was just horrible. It would be interesting to ask whether the Sweetwater site was uh, found before the dam broke or afterwards. Uh, do, you, do you remember what, what date the dam broke? Early, uh, early 1900s. Okay, right, so... Maybe 1920, 1930, yeah, something like so that. So this is 1980 or something like yeah, that? Yeah, this is 40... So this is 40, quite, quite a bit later. 40 to 50 years later. Yeah, yeah. So, so this site clearly has probably not been... Uh, I mean, has been disturbed. Somewhere along the way, we've gotten a lot of uh, water coming through there. Uh, whether that water would have leached uranium out or not, I don't know. It's an interesting question to ask. Yes. Yeah. I uh, find Irv Taylor's uh, discussion commendable. In fact, I've told Irv Taylor this is the <laughs> best article he has ever written. Yes, uh, as I understand it, one of the um, co-authors of that one was actually a creationist that was working in his lab. But uh, uh, I may be incorrect on that. Uh, incidentally, the article is so good, that table is so important that it's on my web page when I discuss radiometric dating. Uh, and it's uh, striking that uh, some of the same methods uh, would give such uh, different dates. They're uh, still being used. Yes. Uh, this is not the norm, I might state, uh, uh, for radiometric dates, but it is a striking example of how uh, you can go wrong by uh, just selecting what data you want. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but, but the strata says it's 120,000, so the Radiometric J uh, agrees with that, so it must be right. 
I wish I was a little more familiar with this uranium thorium. They date the organic matter in it, they say? No. Uh, uh, as a matter of fact, you can't date, uh, well. Well, they say there isn't any. Well, it is, yeah, that's right. There's not enough collagen to do a, to do a uh, carbon-14 date on. So that's your answer. The reason they couldn't do it is because they, or they didn't mm -hmm. do it is because they couldn't. Uh, but to me, if you don't have carbon-14, you run the risk of having this be the same kind of thing as what we've already seen in multiple instances before, um, as documented by Taylor et al. I, I, I don't see why one can take a method that has been sort of discredited and do a little polishing on it and then use it again without backup. But that, maybe that's my inherent skepticism. Are they assuming infiltration? Yeah, that's the what it is. The, the bones, okay, while the mammoth is walking around, they don't have, I mean, this they could, don't have uranium in them. This could come from anywhere. It has to come from anywhere, in fact. It has to yeah. be leached into the bone. Okay, I'm just checking. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, co come in behind you. The point I was trying to make is that if the original material is not there, that means that whatever material you have is from the environment. And how do you know that that was well balanced to begin with? Like, it doesn't come zeroed with time stamp on it. Well, so, but that's the theory, is that the uranium comes through, there is no thorium with it. If there is thorium with it, it must come with thorium-230 and thorium-232 equally mixed. You see, because if you, if you, uh, otherwise you can't correct. Well, but, but, but how do you make all those assumptions? Um, because if you don't make those assumptions, you don't have a dating method. <laughs> I'm, I, it's almost that bad. So did they, bother, did they bother dating any of the surrounding material, if I might ask? Since, well, the since, problem is... Since it obviously could not be the original, it had, problem had is to have come from the environment. We don't have a good dating method for sedimentary rock. The closest that we can get to is there are some claims that you can date glauconite. But if you read the literature on that, they will tell you that it is, uh, that, the, that the material has to be just the right size and I mean the, the, the qualifications they put on that are are just incredible and uh, yeah it's the reason they the reason they do that is because you can't date sedimentary uh, rock just to, to put it bluntly you can't do it it have inherited age you have stuff that's that is reworked transported from somewhere else yeah and 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 stuff that gets leached out and so, and now, now how do you know it's leached out or leached in? Well, because it doesn't give you the right date. <laughs> how would you know what the right date is? <laughs> well, yeah, and that's the next question is, what is the right date? Yeah. Uh, yes. This is a subject of great interest to me because it does impinge a bit on my studies at Michigan State. You know, we've been talking a lot about um, paleoanthropology in the African picture, and my comments aren't any better than perhaps anyone else's in this group, as I'm not an expert in paleoanthropology. But I will comment on the site in San Diego based on what I did for my master's work. Generally, you have a context when you're dealing with dates like 130,000 years. And you can't just draw a date out of thin air. Uranium, thorium has to be within a context. They've 
somewhat leaped over the idea of looking at the entire context. Now, what I'm leading well, up actually, to... Actually, they didn't leap over it. They said it at the very beginning. It was 120,000 years. They knew that from the stratigraphy already. I mean, 130, 110, who's going to argue, you know? Yeah, well, I haven't seen that. Um, the problem with Western sites like this, when you're dealing with 125,000 years, that's said to be the next to the last um, interglacial. We're in the last gla interglacial, which means non-ice age. The next to the last one is usually dated 130 to 115,000 years by conventional dating. And the so maybe the, the uh, uh, sea level was high enough to... to well, no, it would be a... Uh, yeah, sea level would be much higher in the interglacial, in the interglacial because interglacial. The, the ice, everything's ice cap had been yeah. melting quite a bit. Um, the context that I would look for would be the flora as well as the fauna. They're relying almost totally on carnivores. Why not look at beetles? In the UK, they do a lot of study on beetles. And they can tell there's a different beetle population during the next last interglacial than there is today. And so they can kind of nail it down that there's something happening before the last glaciation. If you except the idea there might be more than one glaciation or might be more than one phase of glaciation. The other thing they're overlooking is botany, totally, unless I can find other articles they're citing. Because you have a different flora entirely. Now we can reconstruct the flora from the tar pits at La Brea, and that's very good because it's well preserved. Sandy deposits in a warm climate like summer, uh, Southern California are notorious for the disintegration of plant material, especially pollen even. Usually they can go by pollen, but uh, when you get a lot of degradation and heat and moisture, and that's going to affect uh, amino acid dating too. Uh, I'm surprised people still stick to their guns with amino acid. Well, acidity. actually, most people don't anymore. I know. They're moving away from it. It's obvious because just the climate around us and sand being porous and allowing a lot of contamination and all this, I'd like to see a lot more work done. And probably they'll eventually arrive at the conclusion, yeah, 10, 11,000 radiocarbon years or however many years you want. It could be 6,000 years, you know, somewhere in that narrow range. Yeah. And they've got to use the botany as well as the uh, animal bones. It's my yeah. conclusion. Well, I'd love to see them, if they can't do radiocarbon on the mammoth bones, at least do radiocarbon on the dire wolves that are found in the same stratum or something. Because uh, I have a sneaking suspicion they're going to get different answers. Yeah. yeah. Um, Okay, uh, next uh, comment. Um, is um, is um, ash layer considered sedimentary? Because you said that there's no Ash big layers are considered igneous. Intrusive. Okay, but even but though they're, they have layers and they're in between sed sedimentary, they're not considered sedimentary. Well, it does raise some interesting questions about whether ash layers can be dated as well as people claim too but but the but the truth of the matter is that the ash layer is supposed to be dated by the time it comes out of the volcano usually in that case by carb uh, by potassium argon because the assumption is that all the argon is driven off <coughs> that's another assumption that's uh, shall we say interesting the, the semi-official definition is as long as the ash is going up in the air, it's igneous. When it starts settling down, it's sedimentary. But, but the point of it is that once it lands, it, the, it is assumed that you can do dating. I mean, the KBS Tuff is a famous example of one that where it's technically ash and pumice. Uh, pumice is also technically sure. sedimentary at that point. But, but you can you can use those minerals for dating. Yeah. 
Yeah. Regardless, regardless of how you define them. Yeah. But, but for, from, a, from a geochronologist's point of view, they're considered sedimentary. Uh, I mean, they're considered igneous. Because they, they were igneous until 10 minutes before they arrived, or maybe five, whatever. Yes? First, <laughs> I was reading something, uh, paleoanthropology, and what it said, a definition of paleo anthropology is the science of being perpetually wrong. <laughs> and I read it. I didn't make it up. At any rate, Janice has. <laughs> so, um, Monty, I'm going to put you on the spot. Because Monty's an engineer, right? Yes. And he was involved at the, um, at the reservoir, the Hemet Reservoir. Would you take a mic? Where, where, did they find human um, send bones there? There's a museum in case some of you would like to see mastodons that were were uh, yeah, hand it, hand it down. Okay, that were here, found here at that site. Here it comes, it's right behind you. Yeah. Okay, Monty. Yeah. So when I worked at the the dam down there in Hammond, um, I was working on the East Dam. So that's on the eastern side of the Dominogoni Valley there, and in order to build the dam, we had to excavate to bedrock to make the foundation. Well, it was about 130, 40 feet down. So we had a mile long by a quarter mile wide by 150 foot deep excavation. About 20 million yards came out. And we had paleontologists here from the, the San Bernardino County Natural Museum came down and they monitored all the excavations. Sort of like this guy was doing. Yeah, same kind of deal. So we found several, you know, they, they found some cats, they found some camel bones and stuff every once in a while. But we also found at least, I think, two? I don't remember the number. We found several uh, mammoths down there. And they were probably 60, 70 feet down, I think, about the time we found them. And so they cordoned off that area where they were working around everything, and the, all the paleontologists came in, and you know they plastered up everything and saved it all, and then trucked it off all over here to the to the museum and took care of it. And then after the dam was finished and everything, the MNWD they built a museum down there. So if you go to Hemet in the on the east side of the the reservoir there, they have a have a museum where all that stuff is now. Now, was there any? Oh, I just, I just wanted Monty to talk about it because I knew he knew it better than I did. Okay. I've been I, to the museum. But he told us yeah, that. I am curious. When they found those mammoths, did they find any cracked bones or anything like that? Or? Not that I remember that there was no human um, remains found on any of that. And we had, because the, the, the way the site was, there were. Um, very sensitive Indian burial issues out there as well. So they were keenly aware for any human type stuff, but that was way too deep and that, there was nothing like that uh, that I remember being Do you found. remember how they dated I the, don't, the mammoths? I don't think they tried to date them. They, they just took the stratigraphy and, yeah. and let it go at that? It was. The sediment was fall fairly young anyway, so I, I don't necessarily remember it being more than, even though it was deep, it was relatively younger. Maybe it was, I don't know if it was all Holocene or Pleistocene, but I don't think it was all that old, so. I'm uh, looking at that site. They don't date the Mastodon, but what they do say, it was uh, found in the uh, Paleolithic area, era which lasted from 2.6 million years ago to 12,000 years ago. So you take your pick. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, growing up in uh, San Timotel Canyon, um, I don't know, probably when I was about 10 or 12 years old, my oldest brother, you know, we were hiking the hills and we, we came across mamma, uh, mam mastodon bones. Uh, so we we dug it out and have this you know big long rib and tibia and 
no tusk, no skull, that would be the ultimate, but uh, pieces of it. So it's really cool um, being a little, you know, paleontologist out there, you know, as kids. <laughs> so apparently there's some of that stuff buried all over the place. It's, it's, interesting to, it's interesting to try modeling that after a flood because during the flood you can bury all kinds of stuff. Afterwards, it gets a little dicey how to get um, mammoths uh, down that low. Um, not saying it can't be solved, but I'm, uh, but I'm saying that we creationists do have a little work for our, ourselves to do as well. Yes? This is a completely uninformed question. Uh, not on the level of any of the I've heard so far, but... <coughs> Having grown up in the area, I, as a very small child, was impressed with the fact that in La Brea there were tar pits. But um, all of these sites that you've also mentioned, various archaeological sites, don't seem to have been tar pits. Are there any other tar pits in, in, uh, in America, or is it just in La Brea, and if so, why? There, there are some in uh, just a minute, just a minute, we'll get you, we'll, Mike, coming, find you. There are some in Alberta, in Canada. But there are no others in any of the lists that I saw displayed <laughs> on the screen. Uh, eight or 10 or 12 places diggings in America. Now why should that be? It seems to me that uh, one of the simplest things we could do here is follow kind of in uh, Warren uh, John's suggestion, go find some plant fossils there and date them by carbon-14. Uh, you can't, I mean, obviously they'll say, they'll say well, all of these are transported. And, uh, but it's but at least a... If a, you get enough of them, it seems to me you, you could settle this thing quite easily. I don't know why it hasn't been done. Are there no plants there? There's got to be plants there. Well, the mastodon is a herbivore. Just a minute. Well, that, uh, the mastodon being a herbivore does not necessarily mean that there are plants in the area because uh, dinosaurs are found in huge herds with no plant material, and the plant material is found in huge deposits with no dinosaurs. So, uh, what is being buried is not just in situ stuff. Um, mm -hmm. it, it raises a very interesting question of, you know, uh, is it more believable to have mm -hmm water sorting remove the plants from the animals or is it more believable or perhaps uh, animals running plus water sorting or is it more believable to have a, uh, uh, environments that somehow chase out the animals and then the animals all run into a herd somewhere and die and get buried in a river or something. Um, you have to Whatever they are, the burials are not just whatever happens to be there. I th with in the Yellowstone Fossil Forest, there's one clam or something like that? That's true. Two clams? One clam. One clam. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, and, 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 and nothing else. I mean, there's no squirrels, there's no bears, there's no nothing. Right in the mm -hmm. entire forest. And it's just weird if you think about it. Mm -hmm. you'd, you'd want enough specimens to uh, at least uh, try and mitigate uh, the transportation problem, which is severe in the fossil record. I mean, oh, yeah. there, there are hardly no plants, well, no, very few plants, and. Uh, Paleontologists have been wrestling with this for quite a while, and uh, the problem is recognized, and but assumed not serious, that uh, Morrison Formation has very few plants in it. 
how did uh, all those dinosaurs there uh, survive without plants? You had to have food. Uh, large herbivores there in the uh, in the Morrison Formation. Well, they all buried, uh, borrowed their yeah, food from the Pennsylvanian. Uh, and that, the Mississippian. That data fits better with the flood model than it does with a borrowing <laughs> uh, from other places and further our coal deposits are so easily interpreted as as flood deposits instead of mm -hmm. uh, as in situ. Uh, they're so parallel and flat. I mean, this is. Uh, there's a lot of good data out there that we studied. The question is: Is there is there anything that we can do to to study further some of this stuff? Or uh, I, I would like to see people start doing recent. I, I guess there's a little bit of data, but I'd like to see a lot more of it. Doing recent, known recent. Um, Cave deposits, for example, which are commonly mm -hmm. da used, uh, dated by uranium thorium dating. Because, because if 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 it is common, it would be mm -hmm. interesting. There must be some cave animals that have gotten trapped in you know whatever and died, and uh, mm -hmm. and it'd be interesting to 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 do, you know, like I say, known age specimens, and see what kind of uranium thorium dating you get. Because I have a hunch that some of the dates are going to be kind of off the wall. But I'd like to also see, uh, go down there and see if you can find any plant specimens. You don't need yeah. very much for a mass spec uh, carbon 14 date. Yeah. Uh, I don't know why they haven't tried that. And see, I, what I see is the, there are people that are arguing that this can't be human. You know, because you didn't find the humans, all you find is their their leftovers, the design, if you want to call it that. Uh, on the other hand, there are people who are arguing that yes, it is human and it's 130,000 years old. And see, the question I would I raise is, is it really 130,000 years old? Maybe it's not. And that would solve your problem neatly, and both both camps would be correct. You know, it's it's you run into this problem all the time. Uh, dinosaurs have soft tissue; it's still in them. You know, well they do, but they can't. Well, unless you raise the age question. You have the same thing happening with the halophilic bacteria in. Uh, in um, uh, uh, New Mexico, the, the deposits there, where you know the, the bacteria have been in there for 250 million years, they're still good, but that can't happen. And both sides of the argument have really good points. Until you ask the question, was it really 250 million years ago? But that is a question where if you want to see the ire of scientists, <laughs> the, this, uh, this argument is a tempest in a teapot compared with that. The residual carbon-14 argument is so compelling in that we have only one specimen we know of that doesn't have any carbon-14 in it. Uh, That's pretty much true. Uh, this, is, uh, this is where the data becomes really compelling. Well, it's, it's, it's not totally compelling because some of the older methods had uh, zero points that were, uh, you know, were they accurate enough to measure that stuff. And um, and so, you know, if you want to, you can write up most of it to laboratory area. I think you have to want to pretty badly now because some of our data that we have is pretty clearly not laboratory error. We've got over 100 samples, don't we? 
Well, but uh, more importantly, we have some that were specifically set up to test it. It wasn't just incidental data. You know, we actually went and tested it. The only weakness of that one is that they did not do, they did historical controls as far as I can tell. In, in fact, I was told they do historical controls instead of, um, instead of uh, doing actual specimen controls at the same time. That's one of the things that I think that if we have our own lab, we can afford to do that kind of stuff. And I think we can make a pretty close to ironclad case. And then the only, the only answer you can get is that we're lying. That we're giving out fake news. Um, and of course my answer to that is, will you try it? That's the beauty of science as opposed to uh, most other human endeavors where you're looking at the reproducible. You don't believe it, you can go to your own laboratory. Trouble with that is that uh, the story being fake news tends to spread much more rapidly than the other one. Yeah, yeah, but you know, it all, it, listening to the sermon this morning, you know, he touched upon something that's really, really important. Is there a truth out there and do we approximate it yeah. or is it all about the narrative? And if it's all about the narrative, then we're just a bunch of tribes fighting back and forth. And right now we're in the losing tribe. If it's about the truth, which is what science is supposed to be, then there's some explaining to do. And furthermore, we can afford to be open. Truth, what it is, it has nothing to fear from investigation. I think I remember somebody saying that once. Comment yes. on the latest discussion. Um, science then can be defined as the pursuit of truth, right? Yeah. And theology and science then have a common goal of That's establishing truth. And so the title <laughs> of your book, The Science of Theology, is a correct title. It's a permissible title. Um, pursuit of truth. Now, it's interesting you establish a methodology if you want to establish truth. Yes. And there has to be a process of testing to test. Yes. In fact, Scripture is both Old and New Testament encourages us to test and test and taste and see that he is good and test, you know, the existence of God even. Testing, testing. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a really uh, a good, worthy yeah. goal. I wanted to add um, just... Uh, before you go on, oh, I'm going to say okay. two things. One is the title is actually Scientific Theology Scientific rather theology. than the Science of yeah. Theology. But yeah. other than that, preach it, brother. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Go um, ahead. Yeah. Um, then I, I wanted to suggest a possible topic for the future. Just this week, a study came out on Paleolithic human-used tools, homo tools, and they're older than anything ever discovered in the Orient. They're found in China. China is a hotbed for all kinds of <laughs> unusual things, but they're found in glacial deposits. These are unusual. They're not deposited by water, but by wind, and it's a particular deposit called Lus. Lus is just glacial dust, and you have layers upon layers upon layers mm -hmm. of dust in river valleys, and somewhere in the middle of these layers, you have human-shaped tools uh, from rocks, small specimens, but some, you know, hand-sized. They're said to be scrapers and some of the human tools that we find elsewhere. Now, they couldn't have floated in on a cloud <laughs> or in a rainstorm because they're in wind-borne sediment. They also are rocks not native to those river valleys, so they weren't brought in by rivers. 
So we need to look at that. There's some kind of evidence of maybe homo that goes way back, which um, maybe doesn't surprise us because we find all kinds of new reports. Just an idea for a future study. If you have a reference, I'll appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, I can supply email you with me. a reference. And if you, if you don't know my email, you can email it to uh, Faith and Science uh, Sabbath School, the one that you get for your email from, and I, I'll see it a week later, but I'll see it. Uh, I think at this point we will uh, uh, quit and we'll come back next week. Um, I will tell you that in August, I think it's about 11, I will not be here. So in 10 or 11, whatever the Sabbath is, that, that's happened. And so um, anybody who wants to jump in and, and uh, present something interesting, uh, We'll see what we can do about it. By the way, I, I don't mind you jumping in before or after because um, I can use all the help that uh, I can get. Anyway, come back next week. We'll uh, have some more fun.